Hejsan. Jag vill hälsa er varmt välkomna till fredsdagen på Kulturhuset. Welcome everyone to this day of peace at Kulturhuset Stadsteatern. I will uh, have a little talk to you in Swedish. I hope that's okay. And then uh, we will have the lecture in a couple of minutes. Uh, jag heter Åsa Stensvik och jag jobbar som producent här på Kulturhuset Stadsteatern. Uh, och uh, det är fantastiskt att se er här en dag som den här, en stor dag. Och uh, jag tänker på att ibland så får man höra att människan är en krigisk varelse. Det ligger i människans natur. Vi kommer aldrig få till fred för att det bara är så. Då tänker jag på för 70 år sedan på Kungsgatan när beskedet kom att Tyskland hade kapitulerat. Man förstod att det skulle bli fred. Människor gick ut på gatorna och firade. De här fantastiska känslorna hos så många människor visar att det är eftersträvansvärt. Freden är det naturliga tillståndet, enligt mig. Men inte bara enligt mig. Som Anthony kommer nämna senare, tror jag. Så är det svårt att få en människa att delta i ett krig. Det är svårt att få en människa att skjuta en annan människa och att döda. Man får ta till olika psykologiska tricks för att det ska eh, hända. Och det tycker jag också säger någonting om vår natur. Att vi vill samlas och göra saker gemensamt. Men krig förekommer ju både då som nu. Eh, och eh, idag så kommer vi både att tala om vad som hände och att det blir fred. Eh, och vad som händer idag. Och hur vi lever med konsekvenserna av det som hände då, av freden. Som har format oss och det som vi lever i idag. Jag ska jättesnabbt berätta vad som händer efter det här. Så att ni vet. Efter det här så är det bara att gå en trappa ner. Där finns det film i Klara biografen. Och det finns samtal i ekoteket en trappa ner. Efter det klockan två så vill jag att ni lägger på minnet. För då kommer årets europe att koras. Och jag kan avslöja att det är Alexandra Pascalido. Och det är Svenska Europarörelsen som delar ut det här priset. Och hon kommer efter det att samtala bland annat med Finlands tidigare försvarsminister Elisabeth Ren och den tidigare kommissionären för mänskliga rättigheter Thomas Hammarberg samt Tysklands ambassadör i Sverige. Spännande samtal tror jag om hur man gör fredsarbetet rent praktiskt och på den där höga nivån. Vad händer egentligen när de slutna diplomatiska rummen när det gäller fredsarbetet? Eh, sen kommer det rulla på hela dagen med otroligt mycket intressant nere i ekoteket. Svenska Europarörelsen och andra organisationer anordnar samtal där på löpande band. <hör> det kommer också vara ett veteransamtal här med någon som verkligen var med. En intervju här uppe. Jag hoppas att ni alla har fått program, annars finns de i huset och på vägen ut kan ni ta ett. Eh, dagen kommer att avslutas med dels ett samtal om antisemitismen då och nu. Och på slutet en teaterpremiär. För vi är ju ändå i Kulturhusets stadsteater. Varmt välkomna. Jag har fått önskemål från huvudpersonen att inte ta några fotografier under samtalet. Jag hoppas ni är okej okay med det. So I'm so happy and proud to introduce the distinguished historian Anthony Beaver. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> I apologize in advance, but I'm just sort of recovering from bronchitis, so uh, I think I'll be all right, but uh, uh, be, 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 be tolerant with me, please. Thank you. Each country has its own particular perspective on the Second World War. This is not surprising when experiences and memories are so different. For Americans, the war started in December 1941. Russians believe that it only began in June 1941 with the Nazi invasion. Most Europeans, on the other hand, believe that it commenced with the invasion of Poland in September 1939. But for the Chinese, it started in 1937 with the Sino-Japanese War. And many in Spain are still convinced that it began in 1936 with General Franco's nationalist rising to overthrow the Spanish Republic. Some historians extend the conflict even further 
arguing over the long war of the 20th century. Did this long war last from 1914 to 1945, or from the Russian Revolution in 1917 until the collapse of the Soviet Empire in 1989? Most people see the Second World War as a monstrous state-on-state clash between major powers, yet this is misleading. There was also an element of international civil war, both before the war, as we saw in Spain, and towards the end, especially in those countries uh, which had been occupied, especially all those borderlands between the Baltic and the Black Sea. The fact is that the Second World War was also a conglomeration of many different conflicts. And it's also worth remembering that it suddenly brought world history together, not just because of the global reach of the war, but because of the consequences in dramatically accelerating the end of colonialism in Asia and in Africa. Even if one were to take a purely Eurocentric view, The war in Europe didn't really just start with the Nazi invasion of Poland, as we've come to believe. Paradoxically, it began on the Manchurian-Mongolian frontier uh, a month earlier in August 1939, when when the Japanese army clashed with the Red Army at the river of Kalkin Gol. In comparison with the vast engagements which came later, uh, this battle was comparatively small, but it influenced the whole course of the war. General Zhukov, in his first combat command, inflicted such a defeat on the Japanese that they decided not to attack attack north against Siberia, as many army officers had wanted. Instead, the Imperial Japanese Navy would later prevail with with its plans to attack south against British and Dutch possessions and American bases in the Pacific. It also meant that in the early winter of 1941, the Japanese refused to help when the Germans asked them to attack the Soviet Far East to tie down Stalin's Siberian armies as the Wehrmacht advanced on Moscow. It was thus never just a European war, but a global one. The conflict stretched from the North Atlantic to the South Pacific, from the snowfields of Norway and Finland to the Libyan desert from the jungle fighting in Burma and on the islands and atolls of the Pacific Ring, to SS Einsatzgruppen in the borderlands and Gulag prisoners drafted into punishment battalions. For those involved in the fighting in one place, battles on the other side of the world could have been taking place on another planet. And when it comes to the unspeakable cruelties of the Sino-Japanese war, they could have been taking place in the Dark Ages. Some 15 million Chinese died at the hands of the Japanese. One or two Chinese historians claim that the true figure is far higher, even 40 million, uh, but I think that's calculated on the basis of projected population growth um, and the reduced birth rate after the war. We think of the appalling treatment of Western prisoners of war in the Far East, yet local populations endured far worse and incomparably more died. On the Burma Railway, a third of Allied prisoners died, but well over half of the local forced labourers perished. (coughs) Today, it's very hard to appreciate the huge historical forces which killed some 60 to 70 million people. When we dwell on the enormity of the Second World War and its victims, we try to absorb all those statistics of national and ethnic suffering. The Poles lost nearly six million people, almost a fifth of their population. (coughs) This was proportionately more even than in the Soviet Union, although in Belarus the loss rate went up to a quarter of the population and accounted for a significant proportion of the 16 million uh, Soviet civilians who died. Reliable estimates of total Soviet losses now vary between 24 and 26 million dead. Stalin knew in 1945 that they exceeded 20 million, but he had tried to conceal this. In the words of Professor David Reynolds, he settled for 7.5 million as a figure that sounded suitably heroic, but not criminally homicidal. Stalin was in one sense the first Holocaust denier. 
because he refused to allow the Jews to be seen as a special category of suffering. The party line was the slogan, do not divide the dead, i.e. the victims were to be described as Soviet citizens, not as Jewish. The statistics of suffering and the sheer size of the numbers are dangerously numbing, as the great writer Vasily Grossman instinctively understood. In his view, the duty of survivors was to try to recognize the millions of ghosts from the mass graves as individuals, not as nameless people in caricatured categories, because that was exactly the sort of dehumanization which we, the perpetrators had tried to achieve. Many aspects are not as they appear on the surface, as I've learned over the years. As a young officer in Germany based next to Belsen concentration camp, I was horrified by a memorial to the French Jews who had died there. It stated, aux Juifs Français qui sont morts pour la gloire et la patrie. I found the suggestion of French Jews dying for glory in the fatherland quite grotesque. Many years later, I mentioned this to the French historian Henri Rousseau. He replied, I entirely understand your reaction, but you're completely wrong. It was the French Jews themselves who insisted after the war that the memorials to their dead should have exactly the same wording as those of all the other French. And this was because they would never forgive Vichy for having tried to take away their French citizenship. But focusing on the dead also makes us overlook the way the Second World War also changed the lives of survivors, both large and small, and sometimes in ways impossible to predict. Many years ago in the Archive Nationale in Paris, I came across a short paragraph in a June 1945 report by the French security police, the DST. This recorded that a German farmer's wife had been found in Paris in 1945, having somehow smuggled herself onto a train returning French deportees from camps in Germany. It transpired that she had had an illicit affair with a French prisoner of war assigned to their farm in Germany while her husband was on the Eastern Front. And she'd fallen so much in love with this enemy of her country that she'd followed him to Paris where she was picked up by the police. That was all the detail provided in the report. But these few lines raised so many questions. Would her difficult journey have been in vain even if she'd not been picked up by the police? Had her lover given her the wrong address because he was already married? And had he returned home, as quite a few did, to find that his wife had had a baby in his absence by a German soldier? A recent book in France estimated that around 100,000 babies, known as enfants de guerre, or more viciously, bâtards de Bosch, had been fathered by German soldiers during the occupation. In any case, the bare bones of the story could almost have been a novel by Marguerite Duras. It is, of course, a tiny tragedy in comparison to the horrors of the Eastern Front, but it remains a poignant reminder that the consequences of decisions by both Stalin and Hitler ripped apart the traditional fabric of existence. The conditions under which men fought were so desperate that today we can hardly imagine how they survived. Even many who were there looked back in amazement. One Red Army officer, Vladimir Ivanovich Tulinev, said recently, nowadays I can't believe that we were able to live in the trenches, in the open, in the snow, in the cold, never taking off our shoes or clothes with no water or no sense of source of heat. How on earth did we survive all that? Between 1941 and 1945, some Red Army soldiers, those who survived the battles along the way, fought and marched for more than 12,000 kilometers. Soldiers, afraid both of their enemy and of execution by their own side, were put under a terrible psychological pressure. They and Soviet civilians were crushed pitilessly between the two totalitarian regimes. Red Army snipers at Stalingrad, for example, were ordered to shoot starving Russian orphans who'd been tempted with crusts of bread by German infantrymen to fill their water bottles in the Volga. The proud brutality of Soviet commanders is simply unimaginable in Western democratic societies. When it came to ruthlessness, General Zhukov even exceeded his master, Stalin, 
On the 4th of October 1941, Zhukov, as commander of the Leningrad Front at that point, issued the following order. To make clear to all troops that all families of those who surrendered to the enemy would be shot. Ironically, it did not occur to Zhukov when he issued this order that under it, Stalin himself was in theory liable to execution since his son, Vasily Zhukashvili, had recently surrendered. I don't think Stalin was unduly worried. Uh, he simply admired Zhukov for his pitiless determination. But even Zhukov, who had sent virtually unarmed militia to their certain death against German panzer divisions in 1941, had no idea of the most cynical sacrifice of all in November 1942, which was carried out in his name. While Operation Uranus, the great plan to encircle Paulus' Sixth Army at Stalingrad, was being prepared, another offensive, a huge diversion, took shape much further north on the Kalinin and Western fronts against the German Ninth Army. But in fact, the main objective of Mars was to ensure that not a single German division could be moved from the central part of the front to the southern part. The six armies sent into battle as a diversion had virtually no artillery support, while the Stalingrad operation received plenty. This imbalance suggests a staggering disregard for human life on the part of Stalin. Yet, according to General Pavel Sudoplatov of the NKVD, the ruthlessness went far further. He described how details of Operation Mars were deliberately passed in advance to the Germans through Alexander Demyanov, the grandson of the leader of the Kuban Cossacks, who had been instructed by the NKVD to allow himself to be recruited by German military intelligence. This diversion cost the Red Army 215,674 casualties, just about the same as the total Allied casualties for D-Day and the whole of the Battle of Normandy. It was one of the most heartless sacrifices known in the history of military deception. Much has been written about the fighting qualities of the different armies in the Second World War, especially the difference between the armies of democracies and the armies of dictatorships. Much less has been said, on the other hand, about their similarities if one studies the performance of average as opposed to elite troops. Contrary to some of the wilder theories of combat performance, the evidence indicates that only a very small proportion of frontline troops truly engaged in combat. An initial study in the British Army was carried out in Italy by a Major Lionel Wigram. Wigram estimated that in most platoons of about 30 men, only a small handful of men rarely did the fighting. Another small group of men were likely to run away at the first opportunity. Those in the main group in the middle uh, would follow the fighters if things went well, or the potential deserters if they went badly. Uh, General Montgomery was so horrified by the report that he had it suppressed. The Germans, meanwhile, divided their soldiers' combat performance into four categories. The Einsatzfreudigen, those who enjoy fighting. The Einsatzwilligen, those prepared to fight. The Einsatzgehemmten, those reluctant to fight. And the Einsatzflüchtigen, those who will flee from their duty. So it's basically the same as Wigram's breakdown, except that the Germans split the main group in the middle in two. The American combat historian, Brigadier General SLA Marshall, went to the subject in much greater detail soon after the war. Um, and even though some of his research has been shown to be dubious, there can be little doubt about the overall thrust of his work, that only a minority of soldiers in a conscript army actually shot at the enemy. The Red Army was no different. Soviet officers argued during the war that a weapon inspection should be carried out immediately after an engagement with the enemy. All those found to have clean barrels should be executed immediately as deserters. War produces many cruelties, but the first casualty is the rights of the individual. The Second World War witnessed this phenomenon not just on a national basis, but on an international scale, as this true story illustrates. In June 1944, a young soldier surrendered to American paratroopers in the Allied invasion of Normandy. At first, his captors thought he was Japanese, but in fact, he was Korean. His name was Yang Kyong Jong, and in 1938, at the age of 18, 
Yang had been forcibly conscripted by the Japanese into their army in Manchuria. A year later, he was captured by the Red Army at the Battle of Kalkin Gol, which I mentioned earlier, and sent to a labor camp. The Soviet military authorities, at a moment of crisis in 1942, drafted him along with thousands of other prisoners into their forces. Then, early in 1943, he was taken prisoner by the German army at the Battle of Kharkov in Ukraine. In 1944, now in German uniform, he was sent to France to serve with an Ostbataillon, supposedly boosting the strength of the Atlantic Wall uh, at the base of the Cosentin Peninsula inland from Utah Beach. After a time in a prison camp in Britain, Yang went to the United States where he said nothing of his past. He settled there and finally died in Illinois in 1992. In a war which killed more than 60 million people and stretched around the globe, this reluctant veteran of the Japanese, Soviet and German armies had been fortunate. Yet Yang remains perhaps the most striking illustration of the helplessness of most ordinary mortals in the face of what appeared to be overwhelming historical forces. Previously, Unpublished letters and diaries of the time give us an idea of personal experiences, but they also reveal the attitudes and mentalities holding sway. German officers and soldiers, for example, felt that the Wehrmacht was invincible at the start of the war. It never seemed to occur to them that the war which they were bringing so pitilessly to other countries might one day turn back against them and destroy their own homes and families. Their triumphalism in the conquest of France in 1940 was buoyed up by relief that this war on the Western Front was completely unlike the battles of attrition in Flanders a generation before. French and English, equal adversaries in the World War, refused to take us on now, a German soldier wrote home. Just imagine positions like Amiens, Léon, Chemin des Dames are falling within hours. In 1914 to 1918, they were fought over for years. The face of war is dreadful, a German soldier from the 269th Infantry Division wrote home. Towns and villages shot to pieces, plundered shops everywhere, valuables are trodden on with jackboots, cattle are drifting, abandoned, and dogs are slinking despondently along the houses. We live like gods in France. If we need meat, a cow is slaughtered, and only the best cuts are taken and the rest is discarded. With our rifles in our hand, we then break into a house and our hunger is sated. Terrible, isn't it? But one gets used to anything. Thank God that these conditions don't prevail at home. The idea that Hitler had spared Germany such horrors, a typical confusion of cause and effect, became a constant refrain in soldiers' letters. That attitude only changed four years later when retribution approached. The invasion of the Soviet Union, a war of annihilation, as Hitler called it, was pitiless. The Russian is a tough opponent, wrote a German soldier. We take hardly any prisoners and shoot them all instead. When marching forward, some took pot shots for fun at crowds of Red Army soldiers being herded back to makeshift camps where they were left to starve and freeze in the open. Thousands of Soviet citizens died in the bombing of the cities of Belarus. Survivors fared little better in their attempts to escape eastwards. After Minsk began to burn, a journalist noted, blind men from the home from invalids walked along the highway in a long file tied to one another with towels. Beyond the repression and starvation of ordinary Soviet citizens lay the far darker forces of Himmler's killing squads, the Einsatzkommandos. One day, a German transport Gefreiter, corporal, um, accompanied by their company clerk, happened to see men, women and children with their hands bound together with wire being driven along the road by SS people. They went to see what was happening. Outside the village, they saw a 150 meter trench about three meters deep. Hundreds of Jews had been rounded up. The victims were forced to lie in the trench in rows so that an SS man on each side could walk along shooting them with captured Soviet submachine guns. Then people were again driven forward, and they had to get in and lie on top of the dead. At that moment, a young girl, she must have been about 12 years old, cried out in a clear, piteous, shrill voice, let me live, I'm still only a child. The child was grabbed, thrown into the ditch and shot. 
Only a, a few managed to flee the killing pit. On the northeastern edge of the Ukraine, uh, Vasily Grossman encountered one of them. In his notebook he wrote, a girl, a Jewish beauty who has managed to escape from the Germans, has bright, absolutely insane eyes. By the spring of 1944, the situation had completely changed. The Wehrmacht was in full retreat. Red Army soldiers advancing westwards had much to avenge. Our car passed the body of a woman lying in the snow, an Australian war correspondent noted near Velikia Luki. Our driver did not stop. Such sights are common in the Russian war zone. The woman, who had probably fallen out of line while being marched to Germany, had been shot or had died of cold. Who will ever know who she was? She was just one of many million Russians. As the Wehrmacht's retreat continued, nervous breakdown became much more, a much more open subject in soldiers' letters home to Germany. Psychologically, wrote a gunner in a heavy artillery battery, I'm finding it increasingly hard to manage when you've just been having a good chat with a comrade and half an hour later you see him as little more than scraps of flesh, as if he'd never existed. This war is a crushing war of nerves. When, in April 1945, the German front line began to break east of Berlin, traumatized survivors ran back, shouting, Der Ivan kommt. Further back, local farmers and their families also started to flee. Refugees hurry by like creatures of the underworld, wrote a young soldier. Women, children, and old men, surprised in their sleep, some only half-dressed. In their faces is despair and deadly fear. Crying children hold their mother's hands, look out at the world's destruction with shocked eyes. Some fathers, as they left to join their Volkssturm unit to defend Berlin, thought only of the fate awaiting their families. It's all over, my child, one told his daughter, handing her his pistol. Promise me that when the Russians come, you will shoot yourself. He then kissed her and left. Others killed their wives and children, then committed suicide themselves. With the anniversary of the end of the war, there has been a renewed debate over the central role of the Red Army in destroying Nazi power. And this, this should not be in question. At least 80% of Wehrmacht casualties were inflicted on the Eastern Front. But measuring contribution is not quite as straightforward as that. The part played by the Western Allies, not just in the Mediterranean, the Atlantic and Northwest Europe, was considerable in other ways. For a start, there was Lend-Lease, which kept the Soviet Union fighting and saved her from starvation in the winter of 1942. But even more to the point, the half million military trucks supplied by the United States transformed the mobility of the Red Army in 1943, 1944, and 1945 to such a degree that it is almost certainly no exaggeration to say that without them, the Red Army would have not have got to Berlin before the Americans. Uh, this, needless to say, is not a popular thesis with Russian historians. Um, the other aspect which Russian historians are reluctant to admit is the effect of the highly controversial strategic bombing offensive carried out by the Royal Air Force and the United States Air Force against German cities. As Churchill recognized in 1942, this was our second front to help the Red Army. The bombing of German cities so enraged Hitler that Goering was forced to withdraw the vast majority of German fighter squadrons and anti-aircraft guns, which were also the best anti-tank guns, from Russia to defend the Reich. This transformed the situation on the Eastern Front. <coughs> Red Army aviation now had air superiority, if not air supremacy, and significantly, the Luftwaffe was no longer able to carry out air reconnaissance behind Soviet lines. This meant that the German army was taken totally by surprise when Soviet deception operations, known as Mazkirovka, managed to conceal vast offensives, such as Operation Bagration in June 1944, which destroyed the whole of Army Group Center. Thus, although the strategy of bombing German cities had little moral justification, the military justification was considerable. The trouble was that Air Marshal Harris, an obsessive man, 
having created such a destructive monster, could not stop using it. He was utterly convinced that he was shortening the war and thus saving many more lives. One should perhaps also point out that the bombing of Dresden in February 1944 came about because of the request at the Yalta Conference from the Soviet Stavka that all railway junctions and marshalling yards behind the German Eastern Front should be destroyed to prevent the transfer of German troops from the West after the end of the Ardennes Offensive. The Allies, having been made to suffer a form of blood guilt by Stalin over the fact that the Red Army had sustained the greatest proportion of casualties, were only too eager to, a reply, to a comply. With no doubt a touch of racial arrogance, no chiefs of staff in Western armies had bothered to study the lessons of the Sino-Japanese War. It must be said that neither had Hitler, who failed to recognise that the very pertinent lessons for his own invasion of the Soviet Union four years later the shock and awe of cruelty does not always stun your opponent into submission. It can also provoke him into a desperate resistance. And if he has a large landmass to withdraw into, an invading army, however modern and well-trained, will fail to achieve a decisive victory if it is numerically inferior and unable to control its rear areas. The British, French and Dutch colonies in the Far East lacked both the territory and the will to fight on in a semi guerrilla war like the Chinese. They were also complacent. The British fatal underestimation of the Imperial Japanese Army included the idea that all Japanese soldiers were very short-sighted and inherently inferior to Western troops. In fact, they were immeasurably tougher, far more mobile and astonishingly self-sufficient. They did not need bridging equipment. <coughs> <coughs> Their soldiers cut thick bamboos, then threw, <coughs> <coughs> then threw themselves in pairs into the river and bent forward with the bamboos running from shoulder to shoulder in parallel to form a bridge for their comrades to run over. Japanese soldiers had been brought up in a militaristic society. Their mothers would lovingly prepare a thousand stitch scarves for them to wear, supposedly to ward off bullets. The whole village or neighborhood would uh, pay homage to these martial values uh, by turning out to bid farewell to a conscript departing to join the army. Soldiers dreaded disgracing their family and community. And this, according to a number of Japanese historians, was far more powerful than any ideas of glory in dying for the emperor. Their basic training was designed to destroy individuality. Recruits were constantly insulted, slapped and beaten by their sergeants and corporals to toughen them up. In what might be called the knock-on theory of oppression, this treatment was also intended to provoke them to take their anger out in turn on the soldiers and civilians of a defeated enemy. All of them had also been indoctrinated since, um, <coughs> since elementary school, to believe that the Chinese were totally inferior to the divine race of Japanese and were in fact below pigs. During the rape of Nanking in December 1937, Japanese officers made Chinese prisoners kneel in rows, then practiced beheading them one by one with their samurai swords. Their soldiers, were also ordered to carry out bayonet practice on thousands of Chinese prisoners bound up or tied to trees. Any soldiers who refused were beaten severely by their NCOs. The Imperial Japanese Army's process of dehumanizing its troops was stepped up as soon as they arrived in China from the home islands. A Corporal Nakamura, who himself had been conscripted as a soldier against his will, described in his diary how they'd made some new recruits watch as they tortured five Chinese civilians to death. The newcomers were horrified, but Nakamura wrote, all new recruits are like this, but soon they will be doing the same things themselves. Japanese commanders, imbued with a sense of racial superiority and convinced of Japan's right to rule over East Asia, remained impervious 
to the fundamental contradiction that their war was supposed to be freeing the region from Western tyranny. The Japanese army's treatment of conquered populations and defeated enemies dazed Westerners who'd never imagined such cruelty in modern times. Japanese officers talked of samurai honor, which in fact called for the generous treatment of the defeated, yet they never practiced it. They claimed that they were liberating Asia from Western colonialism, yet practiced a far worse oppression themselves, which led to famine and economic collapse in every country that they occupied. John Raba, the German businessman from Siemens, who with great courage organized a safety zone in Nanking, wrote in his diary, I am totally puzzled by the conduct of the Japanese. On the one hand, they want to be recognized and treated as a great power on a level with European powers. On the other, they are currently displaying a crudity, brutality and bestiality that bears no comparison except with the hordes of Genghis Khan. Imperial Japanese Navy pilots would play bridge together in what they considered a respectful imitation of British Royal Navy officers in the wardroom. But they would behead any shot down American pilot pulled from the sea. Japan in the 1930s had become a dangerous combination of ancient culture and parvenu power. I think that the discovery that shocked me in my research the most was to find that the Japanese military authorities did not merely condone, but actively encourage cannibalism, especially towards the end of the war. These were not isolated cases. A similar pattern was found across the army in China and Pacific garrisons who'd been cut off from supplies by the US Navy. It became clear from all the reports collected by the American authorities and the Australian war crimes section that the Widespread practice of cannibalism by Japanese soldiers in the Asia-Pacific War was something more than merely random incidents perpetrated by individuals or small groups subject to extreme conditions. The testimonies indicate that cannibalism was a systematic and organized military strategy. Both locals and allied prisoners of war, especially those who remained loyal from the British Indian Army, were kept alive as human cattle and then butchered for their meat one by one. Allied authorities, understandably afraid of the horror that this would cause to the families of all those who died in prison camps, decided to suppress the facts entirely. As a result, cannibalism never featured in the post-war Tokyo War Crimes Tribunal. By the autumn of 1942, just like the Germans in southern Russia and North Africa, the Japanese onslaught ran out of momentum. Japanese commanders, ashamed at not achieving success the first time, would launch, launch suicidal banzai charges to wipe out the dishonor. In the battle for Pacific Islands, American Marines just gunned them down. It was for them the quickest way of finishing a battle against soldiers who would be far harder to winkle out from defensive positions. In many cases, Japanese wounded often concealed a grenade to blow themselves and any US Navy medic trying to give them first aid. So from then on, Marines always shot or bayoneted the wounded. Racist hatreds hardened with the savagery of the fighting. Once the rainy season began, the downpours filled weapon pits and foxholes. Bearded men shivered, soaked to the skin for days on end. Surrounded by mud, perpetual damp, leeches and jungle rot, patrols and skirmishes had to be carried out in rain so dense the visibility was drastically reduced. The great priority was to keep the ammunition dry. Troops on both sides suffered from dysentery, malaria, dengue fever, and infected cuts and abrasions, abrasions from jungle thorn. Marines found combat conditions even worse in subsequent island battles. Massive aerial and naval bombardment was no guarantee that marine casualties could be reduced. The 2nd Marine Division suffered 3,000 casualties in 24 hours in November 1943 when taking the tiny atoll of Tarawa. Photos of marine bodies rolling in the surf shocked the American public. When the Americans were well dug in, having used the very hard wood of palm trunks to make their bunkers, they could inflict very severe losses. 
the Marines countered with flamethrowers, satchel charges, and armored bulldozers burying them alive. Even flamethrowing tanks were used, which, in a typical uh, Marine description, turned the Japanese defenders into barbecued chicken. The more intelligent Japanese commanders, such as Lieutenant General Kuriabashi on Iwo Jima and General Ushijima on Okinawa, made no attempt to oppose the initial landings and forbade their men to waste their lives in any Banzai charges. They fought from networks of tunnels and caves, enhanced with concrete sliding iron doors and even extractive fans to remove the cordite smoke. With well-protected field guns and interlocking fields of fire from uh, machine gun posts, they were formidable defensive positions. By the 25th of March, when the battle for Iwo Jima ended, <coughs> 6,821 Marines had been killed or mortally wounded, as well as another 19,000 severely wounded. Apart from 54 Japanese severely wounded taken prisoner, Kuriabashi's force of 21,000 men were all dead. On Okinawa, even some of the toughest Marines suffered from nervous collapse, mainly due to the accuracy of Japanese mortar and artillery fire. Everyone suffered from thudding headaches from the noise of the guns and the explosions. At night, the Japanese would try to infiltrate their lines, so star shells or flares were fired continuously into the sky, lighting up the nightmare terrain with a dead greenish glow. Sentries needed to note the position of every corpse to their front because Japanese soldiers creeping forward during the night to infiltrate their position would freeze and lie still, feigning death. But even Japanese soldiers were liable to suffer combat fatigue. They referred to paralyzing fear as losing your legs or uncontrolled tremblings as the samurai shakes. The hatred felt by most U.S. Marines and soldiers, was hardened by Japanese suicidal resistance and also knowledge of the inhumane treatment of Allied prisoners. American troops, like most British troops in Burma, did not see their Japanese enemy as human. Men from the 1st Marine Division landing on New Britain were told by their commander, don't squeeze that trigger until you've got meat in your sights, and when you do, spill blood, spill yellow blood. Some Marines decapitated Japanese corpses in order to boil the head and sell the skull when they got home. On the 9th of May, 1945, when news of Germany's surrender reached the rifle companies of the 1st Marine Division on Okinawa, their reaction was, so what? They were exhausted and filthy, and everything around them stank. As far as they were concerned, the war in Europe was indeed another war on another planet. After the savage fighting on Okinawa, there remained the even more dreadful prospect of invading the Japanese home islands of Honshu and Hokkaido, where soldiers and civilians alike were preparing to fight on to the death. None of the Marines then knew of the atomic bombs prepared in such secrecy. They dreaded the fight ahead with good reason. It's now been established that the Japanese uh, military in what was called Operation Ketsugo, were prepared to sacrifice 28 million of their own civilians, forcing them to defend the home islands with bamboo spears and satchel charges strapped to their bodies like suicide bombers. So another of the grim paradoxes of the Second World War is that the terrible atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki are now estimated to have saved anything between 2 and 8 million Japanese lives, far more than the number that they killed. Another unsettling paradox which the Second World War revealed is that the armies of democracies are liable to kill even more civilians in battle than the armies of dictatorships. This is because their generals, well aware of the pressure at home from the press and public opinion to reduce their own casualties, will resort to a maximum use of high explosive, both shells and bombs, to kill the enemy at a distance and thus spare their own men. The British and the Americans, for example, killed more French civilians during the Second World War than the number of British killed by the Luftwaffe bombers and the V weapons. President Roosevelt's abrupt announcement at the Alta Conference in February 1945 that he intended to withdraw 
American forces from Europe as soon as possible, horrified Churchill. Britain alone was far too weak to resist both the strength of the Red Army and the threat of local communists profiting from a devastated Europe. He was appalled by reports of Soviet revenge and repression behind what he already called the Iron Curtain. So within a week of Germany's surrender, Churchill summoned his chiefs of staff. He astonished them by asking whether it might be possible to force the Red Army back in order, as he said, to secure a square deal for Poland, where Beria's NKVD was arresting and killing Polish patriots who'd fought against the Germans. This offensive, he told them, should take place on the 1st of July before the military strength of the Allies on the Western Front was reduced by demobilization or the transfer of formations to war in the Far East. Although the contingency planning for Operation Unthinkable was conducted in great secrecy, one of Beria's British spies in Whitehall passed details to Moscow. The most explosive detail was an instruction to Field Marshal Montgomery to be ready to gather up surrendered German weaponry so that Wehrmacht units might be reconstituted to take part in this mad enterprise. On hearing this, the Soviets felt that their worst suspicions of Western duplicity had been confirmed. The planners, meanwhile, had been studying the scenario in great detail, although it had to be based largely on speculation. They totally misread the reaction of British troops. They assumed that they'd follow such an order, but that was most unlikely. The vast majority of British troops were longing to get home, and after all, they'd heard of the colossal Soviet sacrifice, which had spared them so many casualties. They would have greeted the suggestion of turning against their ally with incredulity and anger. The planning staff also made the unlikely assumption that the Americans would be prepared to join in. Anyway, fortunately, the main conclusion to their report was quite clear. It was a very hazardous project, and even if the Red Army were forced to withdraw after an initial success, the conflict would be long and costly. The idea is, of course, fantastic, and the chances of success quite impossible, Field Marshal Brook wrote in his diary. There is no doubt that from now on, Russia is all-powerful in Europe. The Second World War in Europe had begun in Europe over Poland, and the notion of a Third World War following the same pattern represented a terrifying symmetry. On the 31st of May, Field Marshal Brook, our Chief Marshal Portal, and Admiral Cunningham were unanimous when they told Churchill that his project was indeed unthinkable. And President Truman proved equally unreceptive to the notion of pushing back the Red Army as a bargaining counter. He was not even prepared to keep American forces in those areas of Germany and Czechoslovakia, which were due to be handed over to the Soviets as agreed by the European Advisory Commission. The Prime Minister had to accept defeat, but he soon came back to the Chiefs of Staff and asked them to study plans for the defence of the British Isles in the event of a Soviet occupation of the Low Countries and France. This was not so far-fetched. In August, as the Potsdam Conference progressed, Stalin's desire to extend Soviet power in many directions became abundantly apparent. He showed an interest in Italian colonies in Africa, and proposed that the Allies should have Franco removed. Churchill's worst fears would have been aroused if he'd overheard an exchange between the American ambassador to Moscow, Avril Harriman, and Stalin during one break. It must be very pleasant for you, Harriman said, making conversation with Stalin, to be in Berlin now after all your country has suffered. Stalin eyed him. Tsar Alexander went all the way to Paris, he replied without changing his expression. This was not a joke. Well before Churchill's fantasy of Operation Unthinkable, a meeting of the Politburo in 1944 had decided to order the Stavka to plan for the invasion of France and Italy, as General Stemenko later told Beria's son, Sergo. The Red Army offensive was to be combined with a seizure of power by the local communist parties. In addition, General Stemenko explained, a landing in Norway was provided for, as well as the seizure of the states with Denmark. It was expected that the Americans would abandon a Europe fallen into chaos, 
while Britain and France would be paralyzed by their colonial problems. The Soviet Union possessed 400 experienced divisions ready to bound forward like tigers. It was calculated that the whole operation would take no more than a month. All of these plans, though, were aborted when Stalin learned from Beria that the Americans had the atomic bomb and were putting it into mass production. Stalin apparently told Beria that if Roosevelt had still been alive, we would have succeeded. This, it all seems, was the main reason why Stalin suspected that Roosevelt had been secretly assassinated. Otto von Bismarck once remarked that the only thing we learn from history is that nobody learns from history. A typically cynical remark from him. Yet the real trouble is that people seem to learn the wrong things, especially the mistaken idea that history somehow repeats itself. All too often, politicians and the media feel compelled to make comparisons with the Second World War. It's become the instant reference point in a crisis or conflict, even though the world order and warfare itself have changed. So why does this particular conflict continue to dominate our thinking 70 years on? In 1995, after all the commemorations for the 50th anniversary of the end of the Second World War, most people, myself included, expected interest in the subject to collapse. But we were all wrong. During the last two decades, we've been fast-forwarding into the future, accepting social and technological change as never before. Yet history has never been so popular in books, in films, and on television. I think this is because we now live in a demilitarized society, a health and safety environment, almost devoid of personal risk and uh, moral decisions. Those brought up in this new civilian age are therefore intrigued by intensely personal questions. Would I have survived both the physical and psychological strains of warfare? Would I have shot or mistreated civilians or prisoners if ordered? One of the reasons, I think, why the Second World War continues to fascinate us is because no other period offered such huge moral choices. Some years ago in Britain, there was a debate prior to the Booker Prize for Fiction about historical novels and the new popularity of history. One critic wrote of her exasperation that so many novelists preferred historical settings for their novels and did not address contemporary issues. Another tackled the same question, but from the opposite direction. He argued that it was no wonder that novelists preferred the past or that readers went for history. Moral dilemma forms the basic element of human drama. <coughs> Society today, which feels obliged to be non-judgmental, has therefore much less to offer the writer and reader in this essential element. Wider changes over recent decades have also affected our relationship with history. This process has been particularly marked by the huge revolution <coughs> of geopolitical, social, economic, and technological changes in the late 1980s and 1990s. In an astonishingly short space of time, we had the end of the Cold War and um, the, the collapse of the communist bloc, the invention of the internet, globalization, the collapse of exchange controls, big bang in international banking, the flattening of hierarchical structures and the, what in Britain is called the less deferential society. Traditional social structures with their collective loyalties began to fade as individualism and self-interest asserted itself. I think it will take historians another 50 years before they can start to assess how far all of these factors were linked or simply happened to coincide. Of all periods in modern history, the Second World War offers the richest sources for the study of moral choice, individual and mass tragedy, the corruption of power politics, ideological hypocrisy, the egomania of some commanders, betrayal, perversity, unbelievable sadism, but also extraordinary self-sacrifice and unpredictable compassion. In short, 
the Second World War defies generalization. But was it even a, a good war from the Allied point of view? As other historians have already emphasized, the Western Allies had to sacrifice the freedom of the Eastern half of Europe to save the Western part. I don't believe that there was any option in the circumstances, but it should certainly rule out any triumphalism. After my History of the Second World War was published, I heard from a German friend that her sister's father-in-law had just died. His most intense childhood memory came from 1945 in East Prussia, when his mother took her children on foot across the frozen lagoon of the Frischersaf to escape the indiscriminate vengeance of the Red Army. The ice began breaking up all around, with many people falling through to freeze and drown. Almost 70 years later, his last words before he died were, I can hear the cracking of the ice. In the mad scheme of such a war, human life was intensely fragile. Survival was totally unpredictable. Thank you very much. Well, my voice survived better than I expected, but um, um, now is the time for any questions or comments or points that anybody wishes to make. So there are two microphones. Um, so if you do want to make a question, um, put up your hand and uh, wait, for a, wait for a microphone. Thank you. We've got one at the front and oh yes, one right at the back. Yes, I would like to ask you, did you deal with the Norwegian uh, story or the, the, during the war? Sorry, uh, what story? Did you, did you write about Norway? Um, not very, well, I, in my book on the Second World War, yes, obviously one covered uh, the invasion of war and a certain amount about the uh, Norwegian resistance. Um, but as you might imagine, there were so many countries to cover uh, who are involved in the war on a more um, uh, on a more sort of intense basis? Uh, so inevitably, you know, some countries were covered uh, more than more than others. But like what particular France. aspect of the war in Norway were you thinking of? I think that the Jews had a very tough time. Yes, that's certainly true. Yeah even in no way. Uh, so there is a story, maybe they didn't, uh, they discovered it very late. That was certainly true, and um, certainly the Norwegian um, church um, made, its, uh, made its process and also did as much as it could uh, to try and save as many Jews as they could by passing them over uh, to Sweden. Um, obviously not quite to the same extent did they achieve what the Danes managed to achieve, as, uh, as I'm sure you know, um, but certainly sort of attempts were made in, uh, in that particular way. Um, and we have one right at the back. Have we got a microphone up there? Thank you very much. Uh, I, had, uh, I have two questions. Uh, Poland uh, had more fighting soldiers than France. Still, uh, France was a recognized power. Poland was not. It was uh, such kind of hidden power. It was the first question. The, the second question... Uh, well, can we do one question at a time? Uh -huh, Sorry, okay. because otherwise I won't be able to... Um, but four questions is quite a lot. Um, first of all, on the question of Poland and France, I mean, I fully take your point um, uh, that actually... Well, by the end of the war, actually, France um, had um, certainly as many um, troops as Poland. Um, uh, but the Polish troops had fought very effectively, extremely well, especially uh, in Italy. The... Uh, point in a way was that when um, Churchill uh, raised the point of France's involvement in the occupation of Germany, and he raised this at the Alta Conference, 
um, Stalin then immediately uh, raised the question of Poland and saying, but do you want to have Poland uh, represented? Well, we knew perfectly well what Stalin's game was. Um, basically, he was not going to have Poland represented except by uh, the so-called Lublin Poles or his own puppet, uh, puppet government. And uh, Churchill realized that he'd made a, a tactical mistake and so quickly backed down and said, no, no, no. Uh, the reason why um, Churchill wanted France represented um, was one that that he felt that if France was not restored as a uh, great power, uh, Britain alone could not help defend Europe if there was Soviet pressure um, in the post-war world, and especially after Roosevelt announced that he wanted to withdraw the American army from Europe as soon as possible, which horrified Churchill, as you might imagine. Um, he felt that you know, France needed to be built up uh, either as a counterbalance to a, a future potentially hostile Germany, which of course never turned out to be the case, uh, but also in terms of sort of defending the Western European um, continent. And that's why both Stalin was very anti-French. Uh, he was extremely cynical because, uh, in fact, he was even hated the French uh, because the bulk of the German transport in Operation Barbarossa, the invasion um, of the Soviet Union in 1941, uh, was made much easier by the fact that it was all using um, French uh, vehicles, which had been captured in 1940, uh, which the French hadn't bothered to destroy before they surrendered to the Germans. So um, Stalin was fundamentally anti-French and was always made very nasty and uh, rude remarks whenever he could. Um, so he wasn't very keen on it, but he was, prepared to, you know, he was prepared to say, all right, the France can have an occupation area, uh, but it's got to come out of either the British and the American ones. And Roosevelt urged Stalin to accept the idea because he knew that Churchill was also going to be demanding lots of other things over the whole question of Poland. Um, so that's one aspect. Yes, okay, next question. Uh, Vict uh, victory parade in London. <laughs> uh, uh, Polish soldiers were, were not invited to participate. You're quite right, and that was absolutely shameful. Um, I'm afraid uh, on the part of Atlee's government, they did not want to um, offend um, the Soviet Union. They had absolutely no justification um, in diplomatic terms at that particular stage, and they, uh, uh, it was outrageous that um, they uh, should have done such a thing. Um, you can certainly um, can criticise Churchill um, for refusing to um, acknowledge the reality of the Katyn massacre uh, after all the bodies were discovered. Um, but I think there's slightly more justification there. I mean, Churchill's priority, uh, as in any war, is to assure the main strength of the alliance, and they needed a, uh, an agreement with Stalin, even though um, even Churchill himself was pretty uh, suspected that Stalin had been entirely behind the massacre of the Polish officers at Katyn and all of the other uh, places of the massacre. But um, no, you're quite right about um, the, about the uh, parade after the victory parade with no Polish troops in London. And yes, next one, quickly. Oh, right, here we are. Um, um, right. Sorry, somebody up there first. There's I'm one. currently writing an essay on uh, the strategic bombing on Germany yes. and uh, how the strategic bombing affected Germany's war economy. Uh, what are your opinions on this? Well, well, the best, um, probably one of the best books on that is um, Adam II's The Wages of Destruction. Um, and to a certain degree, Richard Overy's uh, earlier one, of sort of how the Allies won the war. Funny enough, Richard Overy has completely changed his position since he wrote that book. But anyway, that's, uh, um, that's historians for you, isn't it? Um, anyway, no, the point basically is, I think, that obviously the Allied bombing of Germany did not achieve what uh, was claimed at the time. What you have to realize, I think one of the best books um, on the subject, very slim book, in fact, was the great German novelist, writer W.G. Sebald, uh, who wrote on the natural history of destruction. And what uh, Sebald recognized very much was the way that the British, having invested so much in terms of money, in industry, of manpower, in bomber command, um, could not really stop using it. I mean, once you create a monster, uh, 
like the heavy bomber uh, force of Bomber Command, um, and you start using it, um, it's very hard to stop, particularly because when you have um, its boss, in this particular case, very unfortunately, Air Marshal Harris, who was, had convinced himself with total obstinacy that um, Germany was about to surrender any day purely as a result of the bombers. Well, this was totally untrue. Um, nobody could really disprove him at that particular point. But even after Harris had um, promised that Germany would have surrendered by the spring of 1944, and it hadn't, um, you would have thought that Churchill should have started to take a much stronger line. Um, the, the, the most effective bombing, of course, was actually the bombing of the oil industries, um, both the um, refineries and uh, um, the, <coughs> the Americans at the Sparts, the American Air Force, uh, did focus and concentrate much more on the oil objectives, and that did certainly work. But in fact, actually, if you look at the um, details, one has to remember that bombing oil targets, you needed clear weather. Well, the trouble is, in Western Europe, um, the weather was very seldom clear. The Americans made great claims about pickle barrel bombing, i.e. that uh, uh, their bombing was surgical, was so accurate. It wasn't. It was just as inaccurate as the RAF. Um, in many cases, only 5% of bombs were actually dropping within um, five miles, in fact, of the target area. I mean, it was unbelievably inaccurate. And this is actually one of the reasons why they adopted city bombing, um, simply because it was, only, it, was the large enough, it was a large enough target to hit. Um, and um, it was only really right at the end that, um, and certainly when they had sort of clear weather, uh, that by the relentless bombing of oil installations, they started to have a major effect. The only, there were one or two knock-on effects, which you might slightly bring in, which are quite interesting, um, and it wasn't necessarily deliberate. One of them was the fact that uh, before the Battle of Kursk, one of the reasons why the Battle of Kursk, or the, Ameri the German uh, Operation Zitatel, which was the attack on Kursk, kept on being delayed, which gave the Red Army the opportunity to create these huge defences in the Kursk uh, salient, um, was the fact, actually, that British bombers had hit the um, factories which were making the Panther tanks. And Hitler was insistent that the Panthers should take part in, because it was the newly designed tank, should take part in this great offensive. And that was one of the reasons why they kept on delaying it. And actually, the delaying of um, that offensive helped uh, the Soviets enormously. Uh, but that's just a sort of a small detail. Anyway, you, I'm sure you've got um, plenty to write about in your um, essay, and all I can say is the very best of luck. Um, who's next? We got, sorry, yes, we've got one down at the front, please. Anybody else up at the back? I can't see. And we've got another one down here as well. Okay. Uh, 1942, uh, Britain chose to declare war on Finland, actually on their <laughs> day, 6th of December, <laughs> their national we, we day. Did, we didn't choose to... Def we were forced into it yes. by Stalin. And my anyway. question is, uh, was there any discussion or doubt or hesitation uh, about this decision? I guess the uh, United States did not. No, the United States did as uh, well. But it, was, it was purely symbolic. It was still, purely it was a uh, uh, unique example of one democratic state declaring war on another democratic state. So there were only six left in Europe when it happened. You're quite right, and I was corrected. I was lecturing at Helsinki University, and I was arguing that, you know, um, democracies do not fight each other. And that's when, in fact, um, uh, an elderly professor there said with um, 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 charming um, amusement, um, he said, perhaps Britain wasn't a proper democracy, and perhaps Finland wasn't a proper democracy in the Second World War. But actually, you're wrong. Britain did declare war. Well, yes, you're right, we did declare war, but it was entirely as a result of Stalin's insistence that we declare war on Finland, um, Romania, and um, Hungary because uh, they were combatants against the Soviet Union. Um, but actually, we never, we never fired any shots at Finland at all. You must admit that at any rate. Um, there, was another one, uh, there was another one up at the top. Uh. Oh, right, sorry. Okay, yes, here. Yes? Uh, yes, I'm interested in the history of cowardness. And you mentioned that there are actually a lot of soldiers who don't shoot. And yes. I wonder if there are any numbers on it or any research on why you shoot or do not shoot. 
Well, I mean, there's been quite a bit of sort of speculative stuff. Um, I mean, I'm afraid, uh, Joanna Burke wrote, um, I'm afraid, a ridiculous book called An Intimate History of Killing. Um, I mean, I say it was ridiculous because her thesis was um, that men fight in wars out of some form of sexual excitement. Well, I'm sure that's true of a small minority. Um, but all of the research basically shows that um, for conscript armies, the vast majority of people don't want to fight, um, and they try to avoid fighting. Um, there are a small minority, and those are the ones who really do uh, focus on it. And I mentioned those different uh, reports, SLA Marshall and uh, uh, and um, the uh, Wigram report and so forth. But it was very, I thought it was very striking that one should find this from all of the different um, areas. Um, of course, uh, the this whole subject of you know courage, cowardice, or whatever. How the hell do you define cowardice? I mean, what one often found was that very brave men, after a period of total exhaustion, um, would go to pieces. Now, that, was that cowardice? No, of course it's not. Um, Hemingway, um, who of course was obsessed with the whole subject of courage, um, was one. He, he was in the Hurtgen Forest, which I bring into my new book on the Ardennes. Um, and uh, well, of course, he was slightly helped because he had one water bottle bottle full of uh, brandy and one full, well, water bottle um, full, full of uh, schnapps. Um, but he was actually, I mean, he did show tremendous um, courage because he took part in a lot of battles, totally illegally, because he was a journalist, supposed to be a journalist at the time. But rather than his journalism, what he was trying to prepare was what he thought would be the great American novel. Um, and he was fascinated by the whole nature of courage. And of course, he had his own theories, which I don't think many people would necessarily agree with. Um, I think that the sort of the general feeling, and one started to see in a lot of the reports, uh, estimates of how long the average uh, soldier could survive uh, combat and exhaustion without cracking up. Well, I mean, the trouble is that there are so many different imponderables. Um, you know, there can be other elements, which, for example, the Germans found at Stalingrad was the way that the combination of uh, exhaustion of cold and of malnutrition could create a combined effect uh, which would completely upset your metabolism. And in fact, you were able to absorb any a tiny minority of the nutrition of the food you were given. Um, and that would also have its knock-on effect. Um, in a way, you know, the definition of courage and cowardice, I think, is, is almost an, an impossible one. But what, all those I can say is, you know, um, there are going to be those who will crack up actually at the very first um, mention, or sorry, sorry, the very first experience. Um, again, as I'm describing in the new book, I mean, the American system of replacements bringing in these, I'm afraid, completely, virtually almost untrained boys, um, or guys, men who were sort of too old, frankly, for combat in those very harsh conditions, and sending them straight into combat. I mean, they went to pieces immediately. Um, in fact, both Hemingway and his wife, uh, Martha Gellhorn, uh, bring in what was obviously a clearly a very black joke at the time, uh, saying it would be easier to shoot the replacements before they were even sent up to the front line because then we wouldn't have to bother about taking their bodies back afterwards, uh, which, is, you know, uh, which gives you an idea of quite how sick the whole system uh, was in that particular way. Um, but no, I mean, I'm afraid it's sort of one of those almost indefinable, indefinable elements, I think. Uh, but I, I, I do think that people are a lot further forward now uh, in the way that they look at it. I, in my book on um, D-Day, I was very interested by the way that American and British psychiatrists uh, were very much struck by the way that the German soldiers seemed to stand up uh, and resist, if you like, or delay uh, any breakdown through psychoneurotic um, uh, disorder and um, or combat exhaustion, whatever you want to call it. Um, and they were interested because the German soldiers had suffered much more under the bombardment of artillery or bombs and so forth than the British or the Americans. And so why were they much less uh, susceptible to it? And they concluded, in fact, that, of course, uh, Hitler's militarization of the German nation from 1933 onwards had actually prepared them psychologically for war far better than the essentially civilian armies of the United States and Britain. And this is always going to be the problem with an essentially democratic army um, and, its, and its psychological preparation. I mean, the, the, there are many ways that you can sort of help to prepare uh, soldiers. I remember, in fact, in the British Army, when there was the Lockerbie bombing and that airliner was blown up 
over uh, Scotland. Um, one of the uh, battalion of, the, in fact, it was of the Royal Highland Fusiliers, was sent in to pick up the pieces of the bodies. And psychiatrists accompanied them to sort of see what the result was. And they were astonished how well they stood up to it. What they didn't realize was that these soldiers had just had their preparation training for Northern Ireland, which actually the preparation training included sitting through what could, one could almost describe as snuff movies, i.e. of movies where they had to sort of watch bodies being blown up to prepare them for what they were going to see in Northern Ireland. Ireland. So, in fact, they actually um, were, were less shaken uh, by, by this preparation when they actually had to start picking up, picking up the body parts from the aircraft. I think we've got time for just one more. Uh, yes. You, you haven't mentioned Sweden, either because Sweden was not a participant or you are just tactful. Uh, there is still a debate in Sweden about Sweden's role in the Second World War. Uh, how would you say how far or how close was Sweden to being actively involved? In, in the fighting, the war? Well, you cannot generalize really about, entirely about Sweden's role in the war. And I think that I know that there's been a lot of sort of debate and uh, self-searching, if you like, in, in Sweden on, on the subject. Um, there were um, many Swedes, particularly, say, industrialists, who uh, profited greatly out of uh, the Second World War by mainly supplying um, Germany, the iron ore, and uh, uh, the other necessities which uh, uh, Germany needed at that particular time. So Sweden was, in a, if you like, a very profitable position. But the other, on the other side, uh, there were many Swedes, as we know, uh, who took great risks um, in, uh, humanitarian, in humanitarian actions. Um, so I think that, uh, going back to slightly what I was saying about, if you like, the fascination with the Second World War, I think one of the reasons perhaps why there is a, 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 such a, still such an interest in the Second World War in Sweden is, again, the posing that sort of question to oneself, you know, uh, did we do the right thing? What would we have done if we'd been occupied? Uh, would we have behaved in the same way as, say, the Norwegians in terms of resistance? Or uh, would we have fought back like the Finns or, or whatever it might be? I think every country, every individual to a certain degree uh, is intrigued by those sort of questions. And uh, I'm sure that that uh, is probably uh, the, case, the case here too. Anyway, I think um, that's probably, uh, I'm sure you're probably sick of the sound of my voice by now. So uh, anyway, thank you all very much indeed. Thank you so much.